Good morning, good afternoon, greetings and salutations, good evening to wherever you are in the world. Today I have Chloe Tartan, Dr. Chloe Tartan, who has been with us before back in December 2021, which seems like a lifetime ago now. Um, and Chloe has a new position and she also wrote a paper and I saw her on an interview that she was doing with Enchain and I was like, literally emailed you straight away and said Chloe can I read your paper please because it sounds really really cool and amazing so I did and Chloe sent me the paper and agreed to come on and talk about it which I'm absolutely thrilled about so it's lovely to see you again as well so thank you for joining us Thank you for having me. I also commend you for reading the paper because it's like 30 pages long. <laughs> I, I, mean, like, there's, I, I do read quite slowly, I must admit that, but I was riveted. Like I literally couldn't put it down because the subject of the paper is something that's really close to my heart and I know that it's quite close to your heart as well. So, um, But first, let's just have a little recap. You were with Enchain, but now you're with Accenture UK and Ireland, who I had a little look into, and they're a massive company. So your technology sustainability, so do you want to explain a little bit about, about your new position and why this paper came about, and then we can talk about the paper. Yeah, of course. So I moved to Accenture a year ago um, to a new practice um, called Technology Sustainability. Um, as the name implies, it is very broad. Um, and, and and so the areas, the way the, the, the team is, is separated is you've got um, sustainability in technology. So that's looking at all sort of IT carbon footprints and trying to reduce the, uh, improve the sustainability of technology itself. And then there's sustainability by technology, which is where I sit, which is literally how can you use any type of technology to uh, for sustainability use cases and that could be environmental social uh incredibly broad um so <clears throat> the paper when that came out which i'd written during my time at Enchain, um is very complementary to the kind of work i'm doing now because it's obviously looking at how you can use technology like technologies like blockchain to support social welfare yeah. um so yeah yeah, I remember environmental, social and governance was something that you were really passionate about as well, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 So how long did it take you to write? Because it is only six pages long. <laughs> That's a really good question. So we start, it's, it's, it was off the back of a collaboration with Swansea University. So um, it's a lady called Annie there who's a fantastic um lecturer really passionate about looking at sort of innovative technology like blockchain ai and, and how you can use that to uh to to improve um social welfare so uh, and her focus is digital inclusion actually which is what the paper goes into quite a bit right. um and that collaboration started off during lockdown so it would have been my time scales are all messed up a couple of years ago at least yeah. uh, two three years ago um i think the paper itself probably took a year but that was because there was a me moving to Accenture you know so sort of having to reprioritize and find the time to work on it in my in my spare time but also I had to do a lot of reading for it so I'm my yeah. background is in sort of physics and technology and this is a the, the, the first sort of social sciences piece of research I've done so we had yeah. to upskill hence why the re references are like <laughs> 10 pages long or something <laughs> there's a lot of reading went into that and all these different concepts of technology but not making it too technical so you can actually understand it in the context of social sciences yeah. and yeah even in the paper you probably might have seen like it's a sort of inviting economist specialist in the field because I'm not I'm certainly not a specialist in the area to comment on the paper to help kind of bring it to life and make it something that that we could potentially implement so yeah yeah I mean I know there's a lot of research gone into it because of just literally the subject matter that, that is and I remember we had a conversation about lasers because you were doing lasers um ah. so your paper is there's a journal um and this is the address for it and I was quite intrigued it's openjournals.wu.ac.au AT and all the rest of it and it's in a, a pdf which you can download the pdf as well but firstly because it's the journal of ERSA what what is that so ERSA is the European Regional Science Association and this is a uh, so as I mentioned 
Annie is the, our contact at Swansea University. She's an editor for this journal. So that was how the opportunity came up, was we were having these really interesting discussions about blockchain. Obviously, she's coming in, looking at it from a sort of social science point of view. And then we, we had this idea to put, to put forward a paper. And it was a special issue that Swansea University uh, had with this with this journal. So it's all around digital inclusion. If you see the sort of other kind of papers in there, it looks at exploring that concept of how you can narrow that digital divide this was one that was looking te- specifically at how technology can support that yeah our research question is as follows can a welfare data management system be created using the cutting edge technologies of the fourth industrial revolution that ensures the digital inclusion of groups in all societies now there is a dirty word in there which is the uh, fourth technical revolution or whatever it is people the wef word that people are fringing around going uh, yeah uh, mm, mm, fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> Um, but actually, this is it's about the technology side of things, isn't it, really? And, and where that's going and let's like say blockchain, AI and all of that is kind of this fourth industrial revolution. Is, this, is that how? I... Yeah, it was it was a bit more of an academic um, catch all phrase, but essentially it was mm. saying, you know, the digital divide came up from the Internet era, basically, as people, you know, as, as the world sort of went online, um, lots of people didn't have access to digital skills, digital hardware, um, data, Wi-Fi yeah. access, you know. So, and that that divide became really, really obvious during lockdown, obviously, when, when people yeah. were just completely isolated. Lots of yeah. different kind of vulnerable groups fall into that category by being isolated. And obviously we're, we're just seeing technology, you know, advance at an incredibly rapid rate. So, you know, when I wrote this paper, I really had in mind um, looking at how, you know, I kept thinking about well, lockdown and how people were sort of isolated because they didn't have access to the right skills. And it talks a little bit about universal credit as that's the first digital by default benefit, which is mm. it requires you to have digital skills in order to claim for benefits that are there to help people who met, probably don't have those skills. Um, but actually, you know, in, in the current sort of times we're in, seeing how chat GPT is just, you know, an AI is just taking over our lives. It kind of shows that, you know, this is a really, it's, it's a very topical issue. And actually it's something that we need to really invest time to understand. When we talk about digital welfare, there's kind of two strands to it. One is how do you create a welfare system that is digitalized, right? So for example, a universal credit type welfare where it is, a digital by default benefit but then digital welfare can also be interpreted as the welfare of the individual in the digital world you know you've got things like in the metaverse where people can have to make sure that they're still respectful to one another even though they're running around as um you know with their little avatars but then also when it comes to the use of ai how do you make sure that that's implemented in a fair way given that it's you know, trained up and inherently sort of biased data. You've got to make sure that I think there's been examples of cases where chat GPT has been a bit passive aggressive. (laughs) Um, Mm. So, you know, so I didn't quite realise the implications of this this piece of research until recently, if I'm honest with you. Because as I said, when you think about those two different strands of digital welfare, it's a huge topic. Yeah. um, And it's only going to get you know, more, more and more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've hit on a couple of things already there, because I, I like to throw this, this stat out, 37% of the world's population still aren't online. But also recently, um, I read a report that said 1 million people in the UK during the last year had actually cancelled their broadband. Now, That's quite interesting within itself because it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not still online because everybody carries around a phone with them. And I looked at stats on phones and literally the typical, I think there's 95% of the population have a mobile phone and mostly probably two mobile phones, at least in the household. So that's quite interesting within itself because there seems to be this kind of real flip of people coming away from broadband because they want to be more kind of mobile so using mobiles more often and because apps are more accessible so that's great but also this kind of divide of there are still people who aren't actually on 
the internet at all. But also there is a, a kind of very small population of people that actually really don't want to be online. So how, you know, when it comes to that, and, and also you're saying about the AI, well, safeguarding is a big thing because that's mental health and safeguarding children, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a huge Mm. kind of landscape that you're really looking into and UBI from my own personal experiences there is a lot there are a lot of problems with the welfare system in this country and those problems seem to have got worse and worse and worse I don't think they've got better from my own personal experience within that system and it's not friendly and it is quite uh demoralizing to actually have to you know be a part of that system but they don't make it easy for you and they don't offer any information for you you literally have to go and find everything yourself you know so people who do suffer um say from health problems i have found that the esa going from the employment support allowance onto a ubi literally there are a lot of disabled people who were left out of a system for some reason so this is the the way that i was reading this paper was um it was looking at every aspect and every kind of different genre of personality and that might actually have to go and at some point claim some benefit and how they would be treated and I think that the way that this has been put together personally myself is is groundbreaking because there are so many aspects of this paper that would work so well within the system that would actually make it a better system there is a lot of fraud with internally in the in in the system as well and I think that's something because just the way that they actually keep a track of the accounts and things for example a person may sign on because they've lost their job or they've been made sick or you know and they can't get a new job so you might have to sign on and you go and sign on and then it will take is it about six weeks or so before you can actually have any income from them to you but also within that time that might not be a full benefit and that might only be for UBI and then you have to go to the housing section and then you have to go and you get your credits for your council tax and then many people have been given credits for food banks and stuff but these are all like paper vouchers and things Mm -hmm. so do you want to explain how your approach was for kind of looking at these problems and then coming up with these solutions Mm. because there are a lot of solutions in this paper (laughs) I'll try to simplify it um but I think you know you're right there's there's a lot of issues I actually actually had to 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 trim it down a bit because it was uh, you know it's like Pandora's box looking and starting to look at things and realizing oh gosh well there's this there's that um but you know, if you if you boil it down to the, the fundamental sort of issues that it's trying to tackle, it's the lack of transparency, which you've already mentioned. How can you get enough transparency to be able to then audit the way that the welfare system is um, operating uh, purely so that you can ensure the right, you know, everyone has the support that they need, um, and ensure that it's done in a fair way, because of course there's always issues around fraud. And, you know, where there have been sort of reformations to try and tackle those people who are disadvantaged have been caught out by the, by, by those reformations. So, you know, it's this it's a double edged sword. You've got to to ensure that, you know, the right people are getting the right help in order mm. to do that. You need to have enough transparency into the system. Of mm. course, it's, you know, we're, we're dealing with people's personal information here. So you can't just make it all public. Um, and so how can you ensure that you have that privacy whilst getting the information out that you need so it's it's really kind of i think that's the fundamental issue there that there's obviously other aspects around you know the way that the public sector is is highly siloed you know so it's really tricky from one department to share information to the other and and and, and as a result of that there's obviously massive delays in in trying to get that information to the right hands but i would say if you boil it down to the core issue it's that it's you know, it's, it's it's being able to get the right information to the right hands. So obviously it wouldn't be feasible to say, 
put it all in the blockchain, for example, because we know that blockchain technology itself, you know, once data is on there, you, it, it, it provides an immutable timestamped reference to that data source. So, you know, it's far easier to audit and, and you've got that audit trail due to the way data is structured on the blockchain. So it, you can't just do that because we're dealing with private private data here, you know. You also need to be reason, feasible, reasonable about the amount of funding that we need to go into such a system. How would you solve for something without overhauling the way things are run at the moment? Um, and I, there are sort of there are many instances where the NHS has explored sort of trying to centralise their, their 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 systems because obviously, you know, each different department operates in a sort of siloed way. They don't talk to each other. Either. They don't talk to each other, and it's really mm-hmm. different. It's tricky. You know, I've got friends who work as in, in NHS nurses, doctors, and it's really hard for them as well because, mm-hmm. unfortunately, you know, information can slip through the through the gaps in the system. Yeah. Um, I tell you what, one thing that's quite annoying is I've, I've experienced this many times because obviously I work in the entertainment industry and I'm in and out of work left, right and centre and sometimes for very long periods of time and sometimes not. Um, but one of the things I found was that if you have a health issue and you've already told them what that health issue is and then you're, you've not been on the system but then you come back, you have to go through the whole rigmarole all over again. And from the point of view of someone who's, you know, has to kind of go and sign on it's like i told you this already why haven't you got this information why are you still asking me the same questions that you're asking me then and i've already proved all of this to you and now you're still asking me the same questions to prove again to you what i already proved to you a while ago um so that the you know that's a really easy frustration to kind of actually say to people now i do understand that you know data protection and you can only just keep data for so long and everything but there must be an easier way of doing it because some people f- will have a really hard time and get quite distressed within the way that that's actually you know that system kind of works the way that i think it would work really well as well is literally on the account inside because i'm big on the account inside of things because this is where i see that this is absolutely phenomenal for example you can be underpaid and you can be underpaid for a very long period of time but then when they realize and they back pay you they don't just pay you a lump like they pay you a lump sum of the back pay but they don't put it on your payments record as a lump sum that you've received they go back to the very first date that you signed on and they alter all of those amounts to make it look as though you were paid the full amount originally when you weren't the way that I see that is kind of fraudulent but I don't know you know I mean this is how they work but I don't think that that's right in any way whatsoever so this again is where I think this you know blockchain would really help in that instance because they wouldn't be able to go back and alter those those amounts you know say you signed on in December and now it's uh, June and you got 90 pounds in in December a week but you should have got 150 pounds a week they go back to December and they just alter that 90 to 150 so it looks then on the record as though literally you know a quick glance oh you got that money you got that money you got that money so you then well I haven't had this money yet these are small little things yeah I think you know where the system is set up to try to rectify its errors and and in order probably for accounting reasons just so that everything's kind of a lot you know easy to track for them it it yeah. can it can lead to errors for the recipient right so you you actually are still left wondering you know what you know when are you going to see that or, you know it's it's, yeah. it's tricky to chase up isn't it so you need a way to be able to be able to to audit sort of historical events and be able to look at the exact status of um of the welfare that's received and and to be able to also learn from mistakes which obviously yeah. if the system's kind of not allowing you know it doesn't it doesn't um make it easy for anyone in the system to be able to rect- to be able to learn from those mistakes so i think again i still think that is linked inherently linked to the to the lack of transparency that we have in the public sector and and yeah. it's just it's just to, because I, I understand the, the sensitive nature of the data we're dealing with, and I understand that also, you know, 
it's really tricky to do an upgrade on something that's where so many millions of people are reliant upon. Um, it's just and there's, there's been funding as well to be able to just change everything, you know. And, and we've seen that in other cases. There's so many scenarios where um, I can't remember where in India it was, but there was this um, digital welfare solution I was reading about and it was using biometric data and actually, the, you know, that the, there were some errors in the way that the biometrics were being read. And so then people were actually being refused, um, you know, food and, and simple things right. that actually um, led to it actually led to really serious situations where you know lives were lost as a result of the yeah. system failing and yet the system was probably set up in order to streamline everything make things more efficient make sure that you know people were getting what they needed and the right person was getting the help that they needed and so on and yet you have to be so careful when you start to bring in automation and you know novel technologies yeah. because of this because of this very reason so there is a lot of there'll be a lot of hurdles um, and a lot of risk assessments that need to be done to bring a solution to an archaic sort of way of doing things. But at the same time, you can't just jump to the novel solution because someone will probably, you know, be left out. Yeah, um, I remember reading about that as well. It was not, really not hard. To sound too, <laughs> not <laughs> to sound too dire about it all, but I think, you know, this is why, again, with the paper, I was really try to think about what is the best way to support the current system not try to just change it entirely how do you, do you bring something to bolster it to make it better and then over time you know we might be able to see some improvements which is why it kind of goes for that hybrid model to say well let's start trying to address those data silos try, but also using the blockchain simply as a as an auditing tool Right. Yeah. So having those access logs showing that every time, so in the in the example that you gave, every time something is changed in the database, there's a log. There's a log. Yeah. The time and it, it doesn't even have to say anything related, any include any sort of personally identifiable data, anything that's sensitive in, in any means, just a log of an event that happened. You've got to start somewhere, right? And this could then help you. Yeah, start with the smallest, the smallest, simplest thing. Like you say, just timestamping, you know, an immutable timestamp on on a transaction. You know that that is uh, a, a small start to a bigger, a bigger exactly. problem. Exactly. You know, you know I think, different. I think the concepts that, that we explore in the paper are very important. I would say the actual solution is is fairly simple. It's it's leveraging, you know key features of the of, of blockchain technology looking at how you could then incorporate those without kind of causing too much disruption it's a disruptive technology so you don't want to sort of as i said you've, you've got to do it in a way that doesn't cause more harm um but then the impact of that could be huge right mm. so it's those small small steps that could actually help significantly so how i because i read as well uh, a great little thing so for example old age pensioners who maybe aren't that tech savvy, who aren't connected to the internet in rural villages. Give us an example of, of the, how you would approach that solution. Yeah, so um, this is my go-to example, the bingo one. <laughs> it's, not, it's terrible, I hope I'm not stereotyping, but I'm okay. So I'm trying to think about a way in which you can support, look, let's think of an extreme case scenario. You know, there's someone who's fits into multi, multiple sort of vulnerable categories you know they might be older and so therefore you know they are not as tech savvy as the as the younger generations are they might be living somewhere rural in which case they don't have access to you know the network the infrastructure and or you know obviously of course in london you're surrounded by technology and it's really accessible so what if you sort of try to start think about the most extreme scenario in which someone might be digitally excluded how would you then be able to support those individuals and and you can even add to that the point you mentioned earlier that some people don't don't necessarily want to be on the grid right. you know they actually I mean, by choice not want to be included yeah because <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of people that actually you know want to go off grid do off grid life you know it's like yeah, heading yeah. Off grid and just want to go off grid i was thinking like the shetland islands and places like that as well you know i mean there's one beautiful island which has literally got 60 people on it you know and they live very happily and you know yeah enjoy enjoy their their nice peaceful lifestyle and everything so i mean that 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 to me is a kind of you know 
we want to include people and we want to make sure that people are connected but also you've got to respect the fact that if people categorically do not want to be online then then they don't want to be online i mean really a solution for that then is so that so i think that's again why you know come back to the to the, to the previous point there's uh, we're looking this this paper is trying to look at what what the existing state current system looks like what technologies do we have to support actually the issue that has arisen from technology if you think about it how can we flip on its head and use it to support the uh, you know these important issues and um and and yet technology is not the only solution so you can't just you can't just assume if you slap some technology on the problem that it's going to go away and so yeah. going back to this scenario the 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 importance of community involvement is shouldn't be sort of underestimated where you've got a scenario in which you know there's a uh, a group of people who are isolated physically or socially uh, you know you, you, there's 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 no way other than sort of engaging with them at, at that humane level and being able to then support them and how do you then then the question is well how do you incentivize people you know within a community let's say that within that community there are some individuals who are more tech savvy than others or who are digitally included if you know if we kind of think of the those extreme scenarios how can you incentivize those ones that are digitally included to support the digitally excluded individuals yeah. so yeah. that's kind of how you then start to think okay well what incentive mechanisms are there and this is what the sort of paper was calling to, to sort of econ economists in the field you know you can use financial incentives but there are also many many other forms of incentive mechanisms to create that community network to then uh, i think you know sort of academic term is to to encourage sort of the diffusion of knowledge spillovers so basically you have that more organic digital upskilling going on with people who are like-minded so there are there are many cases of those if you read um, if you look into the good things foundation it's a charity that's set up attacking specific digital inclusion and they've done lots and lots of surveys and research and have seen that people who are within a certain vulnerable group will want to will feel better supported by individuals who who personally understand them who've been in that situation before so actually if you were to have so sort of maybe a digital inclusion workshop or something if it was run by someone who was similar you know demographic similar or similar background or had that kind of level of understanding it's it's research shows it's far more effective which I, I don't think is a kind of surprising fact you know I, it's always easier to talk to someone who you feel understands your situation better so i think yeah, again yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, it is yes there are ways in which you can use technology to support the system that doesn't mean that you shouldn't also encourage human intervention you absolutely need that especially when you think of that really extreme case scenario where someone's in completely off the grid you know there's, there's there's no way that technology can reach them and so you have to have that human intervention at that at that step one so who was it that kind of was there one particular research piece of research that you did that stood out more than than any other um so i'd say i mean i i would give a shout out again to annie to Badji, as I said, if you want to look, out, look at, into her, she, she's got some incredible um, work out on looking at the way AI can, the impact that that can have in terms of sort of cultural biases. And that really got me thinking, I think I, I started to go off a bit of tangent when I was writing this paper, was when you think about society, when you think about culture, it is inherently biased, you know, and I've, I've always been, my family's Turkish, so I, I'm, I love different mm -hmm. cultures. I love going, traveling and really being part of a different culture and absorbing that and, and learning about that. But if you, again, boil it, you know, if you think deeply about it, it is kind of a set of inherent biases in which, you know, that, that kind of forms part of, constructs that sort of society. And that's where those interesting differences emerge. It'll be really, really boring if you're all the same. So actually, it's 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 lovely that you can kind of have all these different communities and different cultures and things. But then if you're trying to think about sort of systemic change, you know, to make things more fair, and yet yeah. a system is formed on unconscious biases, how do you tackle that? And so my, yeah. I found myself kind of thinking really, really deeply about all this with the intention of this paper was just to think, oh, how can blockchain help, you know, make a welfare system better? And actually I went 
into this <laughs> very deep sort of uh, thought process inspired by Annie's Annie's papers, and she kind of then recommended some other some other work around um, exploring because it's it's certainly not a new topic exploring kind of bi cultural biases and where they've emerged from and how you tackle them and so that that was the the really interesting piece of research I think. That I, that I would say, like looking into like the American dilemma and thinking about how sort of racial conflict has evolved in America, which kind of draws on these similar principles, understanding then how do you tackle those? And I think it always comes back to the point that you need change at the institutional level. Yeah. Um, and so I probably abused the terms micro and macro level a lot in this paper. But what I meant by that was the macro level is coming at that systemic level, the institutional level, trying to enforce change through the way the system is run by, you know, things like new regulation, new policies, new ways, new frameworks, new sort of um, established reformations. But then you've also got the micro level, which is that more community level. And again, we look at that scenario where you want to help some, you know, the you need that that human intervention piece as well basically yeah yeah, um, yeah and so i think with anything a hybrid approach is often the best you know you come in at those two different levels you want to mobilize the institution you also want to mobilize individuals locals people to actually act and, and, and help make the system better you can't just wait for the government to fix digital inclusion you just can't it, it, it it's got to come from both directions you also can't expect you know in the individual to to <laughs> change the way you know society is run i think yeah. it's, a, it's a similar concept that we're seeing a lot with um environmental targets and and you know trying to to make the world more sustainable environmentally yes there's a lot more we could do in terms of single use plastics and, you know, seeing why, why, why are things still wrapped in plastic? Why is it I can go shopping and a pineapple is wrapped in plastic when it's got its own natural casing? You know, it's, those yeah. things are really frustrating. And if I was to boycott any sort of food product or whatever that was wrapped in something that's not sustainable, which I did try to do, my diet was pretty yeah, poor, yeah. actually. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not easy, let's put it that way. I don't live in a farm, so it was really tricky to sort of eat healthily whilst also being environmentally conscious. But it's a balance, right? And it's about having that conversation and trying to be better at the local level, but also in seeing it come from, from the system as well, because ultimately, mm -hmm. how many of us are in this planet, we all have accountability. We can't just wait for the system to change. And as we know, as we've talked about, changes need to happen carefully and incrementally. You can't yeah. just overhaul a system because there's always, be <laughs> there's always something that bad or that will come out of big, big yeah. changes that happen too quickly. So there's, um, we've got this graph here as well. I mean, it says a survey on the percentage of internet users by type of interaction demonstrated that the internet is increasingly being used to interact with public authorities or services now this is also where we the people have a louder voice than we used to have because actually of the the brilliance of what the internet has done with social media and everything so it means that politicians do have to pay attention to what the smaller voices are saying and hopefully try and and take on board more of what's being said because i think one of the problems has been a bit of a, a lack of communication through like you say the you know parliament big institutions and not actually listening to the people who are actually using the systems so if they can listen to the people who are using the systems and, and understand what those problems are from their side point of view then it gives them a, a more overall a more rounded kind of idea of what's going on and this is quite i mean you can see there's a dramatic increase there and this is even before 20 uh 2019 2020 looking into these kind of figures and and everything as well i mean it's got uk consumer in digital index in 2020 found that seven percent of those surveyed could not use the internet as much as they would like to during lockdown because they did not have some want to help them while 55 percent of respondents claim that technology could not replace key services that they needed in their daily lives 
so yeah. seven seven percent i mean it, it's it really you know i mean i might say it's only seven percent but actually you know that's quite a large number when you put it into the context of 62 million people in the country so the percent of that is a huge amount of people now this is something that i found interesting because children and during lockdown there was a, a massive disparity because that came evident of how many homes family homes did not have a- access to because children had to learn online and they were kind of forced to actually do lessons online so many were sent out laptops so and so families could actually get the kids online so that they could learn but then i feel as well that this is then opening up a massive kind of wormhole of other problems so you've got this massive amount of people that weren't online that now are online you've got one million people stopping paying their broadband bills because they can't afford it but they've got mobile phones but some of them are eating at food banks you know and when we look at the price of of computers for example a laptop or a mobile phone i mean you can get them you know obviously you can get things on credit but it's not a small amount so again if somebody's on welfare and they don't have this in the first place Um. then we're looking at even more problems for just those people being able to afford the the necessities yeah. of what is needed to actually get online and yeah. i think one of the issues i you're saying about the seven percent is you know if you have to sign on uh, and you, the only way to do that is digitally uh, and you don't have anybody to help you in the future do you think that like literally everything is going to be online or is there still going to be this kind of you know there is going to be the help or do you think that they will like the in this situation in india Mm. people were forced to be online and it kind of didn't work exactly in the way that they had predicted what kind of safeguards can be put in place uh i mean i i i I obviously can't really predict into the future, but I can, you know, based on how things have evolved in my lifetime, at least, um, and and seeing, again, the implications of, of AI specifically, I think it's kind of a, you know, it, it's it's immense. I, I, I don't know. I don't want to sort of say it's scary, but there is an element of that. I think it's 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 important that we understand, you know, like with any new technology, any new shiny new thing, um you know a friend of mine always gives the example of um of of airbnb and the impact that had on local communities who reliant on income for their own sort of traditional bnbs and then airbnb came along and actually it caused a lot of disruption and yet it also opened up economic opportunities for others you mm-hmm. know when you start to look at you have to really understand the short medium and long term impacts and or at least understand that you don't understand them (laughs) so invest time in being able to monitor how these new shiny technologies can what's the ripple effect of it over time so currently I think you know we can all use technology in a better way again you know I mentioned to you the way that the, 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 the practice that I'm working in now it's looking at how you can make technology itself more sustainable environmentally but then also using it in ways to help for environmental and social issues. So there's a lot of discussion around responsible AI. There's a lot of discussion around reducing Bitcoin's energy consumption, you know, things, technology has a really exciting opportunity to offer offer people, but it does always come at a cost. Everything does, Mm -hmm. you know. So it's being able to monitor that and keep an eye on it. Um, And so again, what, The way that, you know, I I described it in the paper was to say, well, you need to have a framework set up where, A, you've got that data coming through because without that information, you don't know what's going on and you can rely on it and then you can analyse and see, okay, what's the impact of this? I think why blockchain technology has so much fantastic potential is because of the the way that the the data is structured, the fact that it's, it's got this audit trail. So often I work on things around environmental use cases and I always sort of say, you know, the na- the clues in the name, you look at supply chains, there's a chain, <laughs> there's a chain of command there and there's a, 
it's really tricky so if you're looking at your scope three carbon emissions to to measure that and to reduce it because there's so many so many actors involved you know global mm -hmm. supply is you're trying to get all that information to be able to do something about it yeah. um and i think you know that is for that same principle here you know there's so many actors involved how can we get that information i, th I feel that blockchain technologies is, is has a lot of promise for that for that very reason using it specifically as an auditing tool before you get to the fancy parts around smart contracts and peer-to-peer -peer transactions just actually just logging data on it in, in yeah. a way that then you know sheds light on what's actually going on so that's kind of what i would like to see as the first sort of i'd love to see most of our efforts being involved in using the technology in that way starting to focus on technologies applications on ES solving esg issues things yeah. like using using it for the public sector and i think our job as well in the private sector is to help the public sector understand it you know there's there's limited resources again whenever i talk about blockchain people don't understand how it works they just think it's all cryptocurrency yeah, <laughs> you know you spend time explaining why it's useful right because mm. it's not it's not evident um and it's not accessible for that reason so of course there's not going to be you know widespread implementation of of these novel technologies if people don't understand how to use it and what's the point of using it yeah sorry i've probably gone off an absolute tangent no no there, no but... because i i actually saw a tweet the other day i can't remember who it was and i can't remember the amounts but it was something like btc cost 23 million per day to run the network bsv cost like a million a day to run the network um you know btc does seven transactions bsv does 500 thousand transaction or you know whatever so you know i mean when it comes to sort of advancements in technology and being efficient that in itself kind of is a very you know clunky example of what mm -hmm. is more efficient you know and then um, those numbers and those stats are meaningless to the average person who doesn't yeah, know yeah. About don't know about the difference between btc and bsv they don't know about yeah. what you mean by transactions and things like that you know pe there's a lot more upskilling we need to do because yeah. actually in the grand scheme of things we're a tiny community you know, if we think about the, the bsv community we're tiny compared to the world so yeah yeah we need to make it more accessible and i think by, by just... targeting issues that are you know prominent in everyone's lives then that could be a way to, to demonstrate the use of this technology. Well, it's great, um, a great example because I know you're you're into your holistic well-being as well, which is a great thing as well because I like the fact that you actually take mental health into consideration for people that are actually using the internet as well. So when you've got like a little community literally who build their own houses and they make those fully sustainable with, um, you know, what rainwater collection or a uh, composting toilet and then they've got a reed bed pond you know for the composting and they're using solar panels that then then paying back into the grid and then they have literally no cost housing that is how you can be super energy efficient you know and, in, and then if you kind of transport I suppose that into kind of a bigger kind of field of actually you know if if normal households can do this then a business can do a medium-sized business can do it and then a bigger business can do it and a bigger and that's how we kind of become sustainable in that sense yeah i mean it does it a lot of it is actually your mindset which is where the sort of circular economy applies to everything it's about understanding you know how your actions affect affect your surroundings yeah. so you just described to you know for me is a kind of closed loop system where you've got circular best practices you know you're thinking about okay where does the energy come from now where does it go what happens you know what happens at the end of life and being able to to bring that to every part of your all your decisions whether you're an individual or a business mm. has a really really big impact actually you know yeah it's like little things like i've got lots of arms with holes in them and you know i don't throw them away i sew them up you know yeah, completely. You know, you've got it, it really does apply to every single decision you make and you can think of it as yourself as this little kind of 
sustainable, you know, best practices being that you just, at every point in life, you can make more informed decisions. Um, yeah. And I think it becomes second nature, you know, it's something that we're all still learning about. Um, but we, yeah, we'll get there. Well, that is kind of what this little diagram is about, really, isn't it? The Bitcoin-based welfare management system is about how to kind of better... Let's have a look. Can we see this? Yeah, so the idea is basically we need to have more flow of information between the supply and demand side of the economy. How can we do that, right? At the, without having these sort of closed systems, how can we how can we get that information flowing to help everyone? Um so you know the the blue sort of uh the blue sort of circle is saying well if we have a blockchain system that as i said we use as an auditing tool the mm. green is where you store all your private data right so i mentioned we want to we want to make sure that we're not um you know we're, we're preserving people's privacy there's any sort of information like that it still remains as it is behind closed doors public sector um databases um but looking to kind of looking to kind of uh, remove those silos, right? Start to merge those data sets together. Yeah. Any yeah. time anything, any event occurs in that green circle, you log that as an audit um, uh, on uh, in the blockchain. And then, you know, on the two sort of extremes, we've got the welfare benefactors. So that's, you know, the government, different, different departments within the government, but you can also have so public sector, but also voluntary organizations, those organizations that are set up to support vulnerable individuals and as well as the private sector too. You know, ultimately they are running a business, they have to interact with uh citizens and the welfare beneficiaries are those that are reliant on the system. And we want engagement from both directions effectively. Yeah. So obviously the welfare beneficiaries will be logging their data as they do now, logging their information, their welfare requests, for example, if we go with the, the uh, digital inclusion example, you know, individuals who need uh, support with um, benefits to, to get online, right? There's a, a movement, in, I think there was a survey in the, the Good Things Foundation that showed that, you know, digital, uh, sorry, data access should be considered a utility like electricity and gas and, you know, people get support for that. So why not get support with data as well? So so that's kind of already happening. You have your, your data being logged in the welfare system, but then they should also be able to have access to this transparent version of the system, which is where the information is logged on the blockchain. And so... And so on the bottom layer there, we'll have, you know, the public sector logging personal identifiable data into the central centralized database. But then we might have all these other uh, benefactors who are there to support, so support the system for whatever incentive as well, remember. So a voluntary organization like a charity has its own incentives compared to private sector. Yeah. Um, but still, ultimately, we want to be able to, you know, the more people that are digitally included, for example, will also benefit by private sector the private sector, you know, companies who are maybe network providers, they, of course, want to expand their reach. OK, well, how can they do that? They want to be able to work with those individuals that are not currently supported by the system and, and, and find ways to scale up and, and make sure that everyone is supported. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, yeah, so that's kind of what it's doing. And then, and then on the, the left, you know, we say well, we've got auditing bodies and things and they, they can audit both the closed database, but also leveraging the audit trail that comes from the blockchain to be able to to analyze data on there and um a little robot <laughs> which could be a, a a facilitator of this of this platform effectively um i am kind of skipping through details but the the, the sort of paper goes through some examples of how you might um um try to try to run a series of events or schemes whereby those benefactors collaborate to say, I think I told you the bingo example, run maybe a bingo night <laughs> um, where there's also a digital inclusion sort of aspect to it, right? Maybe it's the digital bingo night, I don't know, mm -hmm. um, uh, attacking a specific vulnerable group to be able to support them on their journey to being more digitally yeah. included. Um, and, then, and then having sort of all of this being rewarded by the system, whether it's financially or otherwise, to really incentivize people to engage with this platform and and and, yeah. and 
people supported. Now, I've got a question. Um, it's just popped up because I live in Nottingham and there's a uh, lad baby and lad baby mum. I don't know if you've heard of them at all. However, what they do is there's uh, Trestle Trust and Trestle Trust is voluntary and it works within the benefit system because that's the place where everybody goes to the food banks. They get it from the Trestle Trust. And lad baby and lad baby mum, every year, they've been number one at Christmas with their sausage roll songs and all that money that they make from their sausage roll songs that get to number one and they've been on BAFTAs and others goes to the Trestle Trust and they've done amazing phenomenal work by actually bringing to light who the Trestle Trust were and what they actually did and for helping people. Now I always wonder about you know how would it be worth trying to reach out to somebody like, you know, Vlad Baby and get him to read your paper and get him to, you know, how, is there any way that, because that if they could get on board with understanding what the technology was and how that could better help maybe just even the Trestle Trust for tracking what they're giving out and you know, et cetera, you know, I mean, what what is the process? I mean, how do you, because I, I, not a reason, I, yeah. I don't do what you do. So I just wondered, what is the process for getting people on board? I mean, um, like you say, at the end of the paper, there is this call out for any economists that just zip through it. I mean, so many references, so many references as well. But there is a call out. Um, where was it? Oh, there is a call out, as you said earlier, um, yeah. for economists to read it. But what about, I mean, how, how do you... You should, how do you go about that? implementing yeah. something like this? Yeah. yeah. At the moment, uh, engagement opportunities, really just shouting about it. So very, very grateful for you, for have, you having me on here. So really just want people to, to read the paper. I think it's probably quite long, so I'll be making a short and more sort of <laughs> accessible <laughs> version. Reading. It's so interesting. There's so much ground covered, and there are so many really cool references. Like you said, with the American example that you gave earlier as well. I mean, uh, it's like it's like wow. It's quite kind of mind blowing, really. Where you've got the but carry on. Sorry. No, no. I, so at, at this point in time, I'm focusing on engagement, so getting people to understand that actually something like this would be feasible with with, with little effort, right? Because that's again you know how how can you the goal of this was to, to to not overhaul anything it was to do something small that has a big impact so yeah. really yeah. just doing as much engagement as possible trying to and that, uh, that's not a small task by the way because actually would you know those people don't really know anything about blockchain technology other than it being used in crypto so you've got to have yeah. that conversation as well to for people to understand um how it would all work yeah. obviously you know i think Ideally, we'd be doing some more engagement with, say, DWP, Department for Work and Pensions, talking to them about potential opportunity. I know that they have actually in the past trialed blockchain technology in order to issue welfare payments. It was just a pilot study, but it was discontinued. I think there was some issues again around you know, scalability, but also um, understanding how to control for people's data. As, as we talked yeah. about, people have the right to be forgotten. You know, it's always it's always worrying for people to, to to put data as an immutable reference on a blockchain when you're thinking about people's personal data. Mm. Uh, again, this is how this the paper bypasses by saying, look, we don't even need to go down that route right now. We just we'll just put logs, right, access logs on there. We just want to kind of know if something's been changed or if something's been added or removed. You know, start there, start small, but know that that's actually really really valuable because you can't do anything without knowing you know what's going well what's yeah. the current state of affairs you know so yeah so i think that that's the kind of the the the, the near-term goal is to start having conversations with representatives from relevant government departments but just just doing more of this really just kind of educating people around this these issues um there is a huge assumption in the paper that if something like this were to be set up it would be funded by the government by by some for example, DWP, and actually, you know, you have to justify how public funds can go to, yeah. to do something like this. So before you even get there, you'd have to, you know, do a kind of proof of concept, show that, yes, that there this is justifiable, the cost, understanding the cost implications, 
the risk and so on. But the first and foremost, just starting the conversation, you know, um, these things don't happen overnight, but I think the technology is mature enough for us to be able to implement the idea. It's just a matter of getting all the right people to the, into a room and being able yeah. to communicate the value of that. And that requires a lot of engagement and upskilling. Well, I wish you all the best of luck with this because I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm quite passionate about this for you because I do see that this is absolutely groundbreaking and wonderful and I hope people do read it. Thank you so much, Chloe, for going through this. And there will be a link in the description, even though it's been at the bottom of the screen. So if anybody reads it, I will put a link in the description box so that Chloe's paper is there for everybody to read. And I highly recommend reading it because it's really interesting. If you know nothing about welfare benefits or anything like that, just have a read and just learn something about how the system actually works and what the problems are and how those can be addressed and everything and I think that would help for a really better system myself so I thank you with so much gratitude for actually taking the time to look into this and then to write down into a paper how you feel that things could be improved because I agree with you I think it's phenomenal what you've okay. actually done so I hope it goes a long way and I hope you uh, get some interest so thank you for joining thank me you so much. thank you and I really appreciate you sharing your your views as well it really it means a lot to hear it from someone who's you know really engaged with the system so yeah it yeah. seriously needs improvement seriously and it's needed improvement for a while but I do agree with you you start small even the smallest thing a transaction just time stamped you know simplest of things to start with and then just grow big bigger and bigger with it so I wish you all the luck in the world I really do thank you so much Diddy. you too thank you so much